Hello, and welcome to the Justice and Coffee podcast Christmas wrap-up. I want to wish you, dear listener, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And what a year it's been. A year that will undoubtedly be remembered as one of the most extraordinary chapters of our lives. Looking back to this time 12 months ago, we would have only imagined the scenes of people stood in line in supermarkets, wearing face masks, two metres apart, separated from the checkout assistant by a plastic screen, as something from a rather far-fetched science fiction film, stranger than fiction or fairy tale. But there we are. This is our present reality as we close out on 2020, a year like no other. So I thought it might be nice to reflect on some of the best parts of this rather difficult year, which for me were, of course, the many privileged opportunities I've had to speak, listen and learn from the amazing guests who came on the podcast. And perhaps in something resemblant of a conclusion or the summary to a thesis, a short thesis, we can identify some of the key lessons that came from these coffee conversations. Hmm, I've made this sound a little bit too much like work, haven't I? Perhaps if I framed it thus, if I were to set an end of year 50 question pop quiz, this is most definitely the best place for some last minute revision. That's not a lot better, is it? Anyway, question one, what's it like to grow up in prison? Um, so when I was 16, I'd done my first prison sentence. I went to um, a youth court and I didn't believe that I was going to prison. I thought that I was too young. They weren't going to send me to prison. It was it was a minor assault. It, it was a minor assault in compared to other things that I'd done, and I really believed that I was going to walk, and I didn't. I got an 18 month sentence, and wow. I got sent to Bullwood Hall, which is now closed and it was a um prison for adult lifers and there was no there was no there was nowhere to send people of my age between 16 to 18 so they made a wing in an adult prison full of lifers for us um i i can't say i didn't enjoy it because i did huh. it gave me structure yeah. it gave me everything that i'd probably been craving from a young from a young age and it um it made me feel like I was a part of something and I'd never felt that before. And I kind of made friends in there that I thought were real friends and real friendships and they weren't based around drugs because there wasn't any. Mm. And it was based around who I was and I could be who I was. And mm. um, I knew from that first sentence that I was going to go back and I knew that um, it wouldn't be long. And I... While I was in prison, one of my friends had written to me and she had moved to Bristol and she was like, when you get out, come and live in Bristol with me. I was like, okay. So I got out um, and I went to Bristol and I kind of got involved in a different kind of drug scene, but it was still um, quite a dark drug scene. And from there, I came back to Brighton with thinking that I was going to make something for myself with a little with some drugs in my pocket, that I was going to start selling drugs, make some money and be something. Mm. Um, I kind of came back and it crashed very quickly and... Um, I got involved with the heroin scene very quickly. Mm. Um, what sort of age were you at this stage? I was nearly 17, probably. This is Bex, who was on the first podcast of the year back in January. Bex spoke so powerfully about her experience of prison, having served 37 separate sentences by her mid-twenties. Bex is a remarkable individual who now works as a support worker herself, having broken free of her drug addiction and developed a new love for structure and stability in her life. I love it and I like getting up and I like going to work. I have obviously hard days where um, I see the system failing people and it becomes really difficult and I have a moral dilemma and, you know, I know what... Sometimes I feel like I know what needs to be done and if I can see what needs to be changed, but the people that can make the changes can't, it's like... How like how is something still running so badly? Yes. Um, when I can see how easy it is to fix it. Yes. Um, it's it's yeah, and it yeah, it's shocking sometimes to see that it sometimes it is an easy fix, and it might require a little bit of money or a little bit of time to be put into it, but we'd get greater results yeah. if we did. 
What do any examples of that you think? So I think that um, having a continuous one worker that works with you wherever you are really really works and yeah. having that relationship. I also think that n- knowing that people care and that you're not a lost cause. And this was key, wasn't it? The importance of a consistent person to go to, an individual that knew her and could support her longer term, which highlighted the larger point of being known, recognised, dare I say it, even loved. Bex was introduced to us by Dr Sarah Senka, a research consultant who spent some considerable time looking at the UK criminal justice system and identifying its strengths, failings and areas for development. Bex is an amazing example of why this kind of work is so important because she's demonstrated that change is possible. And if we had the attitude of, oh, what's the point, just lock everyone away and, right. you know, hope for the best or, well, we'll deal with it when they're released, yeah. you know, like that, that's clearly ineffective. And, and Bex is an amazing, amazing example. Someone that's turned her life around yeah. with support from certain pockets of the system. Yes. And is, is, a, is a shining example of why we shouldn't give up. I love the way she articulated the sense of just having someone believe in that. Oh, yeah. You know, just having someone yeah. want the best for her. And yeah. How important that was, how fundamental yeah. that was. And, and I think that's the, that's the thing, right? There's, like I said before, there are people working in our justice system, loads of them, you know, who, who do, who do yeah. um, believe in change. They work in that field because they want to help support change. The problem is that it's kind of fragmented. So mm. I might have a prison officer in prison who really believes in me, but then when I'm released, yeah. I have a probation officer who doesn't have time to see me yeah. or I still don't have housing. Yeah. So we need like a, a conjoined system where that theme, that approach, that ethos, that, va- that, that approach where I'm seen as a valuable, worthwhile human being yeah. who's worth investing in and supporting, giving a chance like permeates across the whole system yeah. from the police to the court system you know i volunteer in um in custody where i live i go and um check that people are being treated fairly in custody and i spoke with a sergeant there the other week and he was saying you know i see this this is the front door this custody suite it's the front door it's the maybe the first opportunity that someone has um to, to with help mm. and so if the police are using that as an opportunity not just to arrest and convict, but they're saying, okay, while you're here, do you need any help? Like, mm. how's your mental health? Mm. Do you need to see a, a, a nurse? You know, that's just, if that permeates across the system, I just think that's a way healthier approach. Yeah. Okay, question two. What would you say is the best route to changing global inequality? I realise that just numerically the issue of child marriage which is technically a girl being well it could be a boy too but most cases a a girl being forced into an illegal marriage before the age of 18. Um, some people call it early marriage whatever but but that that issue numerically is just so overwhelming and so massive it may not be as dramatic in people's minds as a girl being held in a brothel but it really to me was one of the the huge issues going on in the world so like the un estimates it's hard to calculate exactly, but 25 to 30 or 35,000 child marriages every day, which is a number you can't even get your mind around every three or four seconds. But basically, like in a country like Bangladesh, where still 60% of the young women are married before the age of 18 in arranged marriages, and these aren't like 10 or 11 year old girls, but there's some as young as 13. Um, most of them in Bangladesh should be 15 or 16. They're in arranged marriages given away by their family to another family, but ultimately because of poverty and because of a view of women that generally they're second class, whether they're Muslim, Hindu, or Christian, um, that they are basically, they're only good for marriage. That's their purpose in life is to please their in-laws, please their husband, have children, cook and clean. And so what this does is create a massive cycle of female poverty that is just ongoing and ongoing for generations. This is not just in Bangladesh. This is a massive issue. Um, Basically, if you draw a line from Bangladesh all the way over to the farthest um, western end of North Africa, basically this region of the world, South Asia and parts of South Central Asia there, the Middle East and parts of 
some of North Africa, but especially Sub-Saharan or right there in Mali, Central Africa, that part of the um, Niger, that there are, you know, hundreds of millions of women who alive today who were married as children and hundreds of millions of girls alive today who will be married before their age of 18. And what it does, if you just look at the what it does to society, girls who drop out of school and get married face a number of huge problems. So they're more likely to die in childbirth because they're smaller. They're more likely to have unhealthier children. They themselves are uneducated and their children are going to be less educated. They're unable to generate income for their family. They're more susceptible to sexually transmitted diseases because their body is less developed. They're more susceptible to domestic violence, all kinds of abuse because they're powerless as a young girl in their family. So there are a ton of massive problems socially, demographically, um, in the health sector that come out of um, millions and millions of girls being forced into illegal child marriages. So when I started understanding that and then seeing that reality for girls that I was starting to serve there in Bangladesh, I thought this is one of the huge things that, that we would tackle. That was Troy Anderson, the founder of the charity Speak Up for the Poor, who I spoke to this spring whilst he was locked down in his apartment. Troy believes with confidence that educating girls in poor countries around the world and helping to bring an end to child marriage is one of the main ways to bring about large-scale change in issues of global poverty and inequality. And he makes a very convincing case in that episode. Now, Dr. Krishkan Dyer, the founder of the charity Home for Good, told us this Easter why fostering and adopting children is, in his view, a way of doing justice every day. So children that have had a really rough start in life end up in the care system and 70% of kids in care have had some form of uh, neglect or abuse, physical violence, sexual exploitation or sexual violence against them. So they've had a really rough start and it's totally not their fault. They've been completely the victims in all of this. But once they come into care, um, and it's really unlikely they'll go back again to their birth families if something of that magnitude has happened. Uh, often people are put in prison, so there's no way the kids can go back. They need to be loved and cared for. Mm. And foster care is designed to be a kind of temporary thing. You know, while we're figuring out what's happening to the children, while the court cases go on, um, you know, it's, it's, it's designed to end. And you normally age out of foster care at 18. And if you're lucky, you've had a stable placement with great foster carers, but many kids don't. They pinball around the system, you know, spend six months here, three months there, eight months there, moving around, moving school to school. And that really mess, it messes up anybody, but it messes up a kid that's had a traumatic background. And so kids that age out of foster care have some pretty harsh statistics associated with them. And again, it's not their fault. It's part of the way the system's working and they're being, you know, not treated well. Mm. So our homeless population... So care, care leavers make up 1% of the kind of young adults, but they're 25% of the homeless population in the UK. Wow. In the prison population, I heard the former um, Minister for Prisons, Rory Stewart, say it's between 40 and 50% of our prison population have had care experience. And in some areas of the UK, it's 70% of sex workers are young girls that have aged out of foster care. So, you know, homelessness, sexual exploitation, and you know imprisonment those are all major justice issues and when some people get involved in justice it's it's just a kind of i don't know an additional lifestyle choice like i love coffee i love the coffee that you make i think it is fantastic and it's a great service to the world it's brilliant um but for some people it, it's a it's the least they could do isn't it buy coffee from somewhere that's traded well and it's going to be um going to go back to help people that need it uh, or you know buy a justice t-shirt or like something on facebook or share something on twitter or you know go to a conference all those are good things but there's another level there's another level and you know when when you think about it how many hours a month do you think it's reasonable you should be doing justice um you know is is it a hobby is it a kind of side shuffle that we've got in our lives that we just kind of do it as a bit? And I was convicted of partly, partly because of my Christian faith, although I don't think this is completely restricted to Christians. You know, when I think about Jesus, 
he wasn't doing justice three hours a month on a rotor, you know, helping out at a homeless shelter every two weeks. He lived and breathed it all the time. I mean, that, that was the thing that made me want to become a Christian from my kind of Hindu family background was that Jesus, you know, wherever you looked at his life, he was living a just life, caring for vulnerable people, helping them, you know, whatever their background, whatever people thought about them. He just welcomed them, loved them all the time. And so that challenged me. And if you think about it, wh when is a foster carer doing justice? You know, how many hours a month is a foster carer doing justice? Well, I think it's probably, at, you know, one o'clock in the morning when the foster baby won't go to sleep because it's still got the drugs in his bloodstream from his mum uh, or is it uh, you know three o'clock in the morning where that same foster baby still isn't asleep because you know they're still unsettled about their new situation or is it at, I don't know 7 30 when you're trying to help a child that doesn't really do food have some breakfast because if they don't have some breakfast they're going to run out of energy by mid-morning and they're going to get in trouble at school or, or is it at 8 30 when you're at the school gate trying to introduce a foster child to other children so that someone will play with them in the playground or is it at 11 a.m where you're called into school because the foster child has not behaved well and you're getting told off because you're a rubbish parent and you kind of want to say well you know it's not my fault think about the history of the child but you think actually i don't want to retell this child's story this the, the teacher should know this already so if you, if you think about it, foster carers and, you know, other carers too, this isn't just about foster carers, it's just my experience. They're doing justice all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for as long as it takes. And I think that's the next level. And, you know, everything else that we're doing can be a great stepping stone. But I think the most rewarding life that you can live is a life that's lived for other people. And it's a life that's soaked in justice. And that's, you know, that's exciting. It's definitely challenging, but it's super exciting how about that for a challenge? The issue of protecting children has featured in a number of our podcasts this year. At Easter time, we spoke with Special Agent Alani Bankhead, who told us about her role protecting the children of Hawaii from online offenders. Yeah, I mean, we're certainly living in unprecedented times. Um, but I was just talking to some colleagues about this very topic the other day, because um, I mean, we do anticipate seeing a spike in cases. So um, we process probably between two and 300 reports a month, uh, what we call cyber tips, where people report um, suspected abuse. And uh, we, we definitely expect those numbers to go up because people are inside, right? And um, for a lot of parents, I know it can be overwhelming, right? <laughs> Being around the entire family all the time. And, you know, sometimes... Um, as parents, we rely on tablets and laptops and TVs and video games to um, babysit our kids, right? Which um, it is what it is. It's fine. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, if it has an internet connection, then the pedophiles are going to be on there too. And so um, uh, it, it is, I don't know, I, I guess we'll see what happens with it, but I would definitely you know, right now I'm trying to kind of put the word out to parents that um, they should be monitoring screen time if they can, or at least having really healthy communications with their kids about what appropriate boundaries look like um, with screen time. Um, I mean, I, even back in my days with all the AOL, AOL is, is how I grew up with old dial up sound. Um, and even I was getting hit up for, you know, potential child sex abuse crimes. Um, and I'm astounded, honestly, at how much more child sex abuse there is online now as compared to even 10 years ago when I first started investigating these crimes. Um, but really, it's communication is the best way that parents can safeguard their kids, um, letting them know that they're there for them no matter what, or at least letting them know, like, hey, I know sometimes it can be stressful for you to tell me something that's scary, but, you know, if you don't feel comfortable with me, is there another adult that you can talk to that you can feel com comfortable communicating that with, right? So um, whether it's an aunt or an uncle or a teacher or somebody like that, um, just so long as the child knows that they have someone that they can talk to. And then honestly, just showing your kids that you love them really goes a long way with, preventing these types of, of crimes from happening and whatnot. So, so yeah, so it's, we'll see what happens after coronavirus, you know, settles down and the number of tips that we're getting and stuff, but yeah, it's kind of crazy. 
And indeed, this year has seen a significant rise in the reporting of online child abuse. The US charity NICMIC, which stands for the National Centre of Missing and Exploited Children, in April reported a 106% rise from their data. And the UK's own Internet Watch Foundation in July reported a 50% rise, with Australia's Centre to Counter Child Exploitation recording a 122% rise in reports of online child abuse. This is an issue we're going to revisit in the coming months with an interview that I recently recorded with John Tanago, the director of IJM Centre to End Online Sexual Exploitation of Children. John will shine some more light on this particularly egregious crime and what needs to be done to shut it down. Not every episode of the podcast is made for such difficult listening. Christian Guy, the CEO of the anti-trafficking NGO Justice and Care, shared with us a few memories from his time at Number 10 Downing Street, serving the British Prime Minister as a specialist advisor. Is it... Uh, I just wonder if it looks anything like the, the inside of Number 10, like what you see on... Um, what's that Christmas film we all love? Love actually, yeah, that was, that it does, and that was funny because everyone who came to visit me for meetings, they didn't want to see the prime minister or go and look at the cabinet room. They were like, "Where are the stairs from Love Actually?" <laughs> and so they, and, and actually, even though they were different stairs, because in the film they, it's a set, um, you'd still see them sort of wiggle the bottom on the way down, uh, just trying to be a bit Hugh Grant like. So, and you know, if you're working late in the building, and you left with your headphones in, you were tempted to put on. The, the girls allowed uh, track as you left and walked down the stairs, but you were always terrified of bumping into the PM in his pajamas. Uh, he wasn't often doing the same thing, by the way, but there was that moment of fear that you'd end up dancing down the stairs together. I'm sure he did it. I can't confirm either way, but Love actually definitely put number 10 on the map. Christian did, of course, also speak to us about the issue of human trafficking and how we need to have a more cooperative, joined up approach if we want to take on the organised criminal networks. He also stressed the need for a more victim-centred approach to the way we carry out investigations. We will never achieve the level of understanding required to go after the big players in the criminal underworld if we don't first earn the trust of our victims. And we won't do that if they're made to feel like offenders when the doors go in at the brothel closure or the cannabis farm. And everyone gets led away in handcuffs and stuffed in the back of a police van. And staying with that green theme, a few months ago I spoke to Jack, an environmental campaigner from the NGO Tear Fund, who spoke eloquently about the urgent need for us to address the climate crisis, an issue that should unite and engage all of us. Jack helped connect the current COVID health pandemic with the wider issue of how this has come about as a consequence of our collective mismanagement of the beautiful gift that is this planet. I mean, the ways that governments decide to reboot our economies after this will determine what our society and economy and environment look like for decades to come. Like, we put so much on pause and how we decide to restart that will make a huge difference right now is the moment to say okay we're going to pedestrianize these streets because they haven't had many cars on recently and to say okay what is our new relationship with air travel going to be and can we live in a smaller world i've really loved actually having my world shrink during this time and really getting to know my neighbors i mean there's been a huge amount of loss to that as well but there's been something special about getting to know those who are immediately around me and I think, yeah, it's a challenge for all of us to say, okay, what are we going to do in this new world? Like, what new normals are we going to choose? Um, and there's a real requirement on governments to say, how are you going to do this in a way that engages with the crises that we face? And I mean, if anything was going to make us think that, it should be the crisis that we're in. Not many people have been saying it, but coronavirus wasn't just like an accident or a freak of nature. Uh, pandemics like that are far more likely because of deforestation and unsustainable agriculture and animal trafficking, all things that we do ourselves. And so if we ever needed a wake-up call for the way we've broken the environment, COVID-19 should really be it. 
Um, so yeah, we have a huge chance now. And I think part of the task, there's the urgency that we've talked about. But part of the task is to say, actually, what, what is this world that we're going to imagine together? What will it look like and feel like to be in a world that lives in harmony with the environment that we're in and, and is a more equal and fair society? There's a book by an economist called The Economics of Arrival of saying, why don't we accept that we've now arrived at comfort? We've got all that we need. And actually the striving that we continue with is just hurting us. We're moving into a mental health crisis and air pollution. Let's accept that we've arrived and find a, a slower, more content way of life together. I think now is our moment to imagine what that would look like. Hear, hear. April Tam Smith, the founder of PS Kitchen New York, lifted our spirits this summer when she shared with us her generosity philosophy. Oh my goodness, you just, yes, you just said that so well. I think for a while, you know, as you and I have talked about, like, it is hard to make money in, you know, food and, and sometimes it could be discouraging of like, oh, I just work so hard and work so many volunteering hours, you know, and, but then I get to meet someone like Sarone or, so many of my staff, right? And also, one thing that I didn't expect that has been crazy encouraging is what you kind of just touch on the idea of like, I really, I've always said generosity is contagious, but I never really got to experience what that meant. And it was a really amazing, you know, side effect of this whole thing is some of the people that are closest to me or even just colleagues that have seen me live through this journey they know how much I put in they know the amount of time and the years and going from getting the space to building it out and all the crazy obstacles from the department of building when we were considering do we keep going or we were strongly advised to cut our losses short and just walk away and continue to decide to you know what we're going to keep going we're going to give it a try um it's not it's not really rational, but <laughs> that's what I believe. It's what, what I think it's, it's the right thing to do here. And I've had a lot of crazy stories of people having just kind of seen our lives and then join us and said, hey, we want in. You know, one funny story is at a work party one year, I was just chatting with someone, a colleague, someone who was more senior than I am. and. You know, he at first was teasing that what I was going to do with the leftover beer money from that night <laughs> when they said, if people had money left over, you know, give it to Tam so she can go build a well. And off of that, of course, I took the opportunity and said, wow, that's so nice. But you know, it only cost, I used only very loosely there, I know, but I was just trying to jokingly bring up the fact, you know, it costs like $75,000 to build a school in Congo and that educate 220 kids. Maybe it's worth it. Like, and by the end of that party, I actually walked out of a derivatives Christmas party where he said, you know what? Sure, let's do it. You put in $25,000, i will double it. We'll build a school together. And that's just one of the very many, of course, they're all not to this magnitude, but just generosity story of people saying like, hey, I want in, like, let's do this. Let's build a school. Let's fund these cancer screening. Let's build a new maternity center in Haiti and, and, and so on and so forth. We finished 2020 with a two-part special. I had the privilege of interviewing Claire, who was introduced to me by another guest from the podcast, Emily Chort, the founder of Ella's, a charity that supports women who have left situations of exploitation. Claire spoke with me about her experience of being trafficked to France by a man she met online shortly after arriving at university. Um, so then, yeah, I, I went over and I met him. And what was that like when you when you met him? And and actually, where else was he? In France. So how, so, what did you do? Did you get the train there or fly there or? Yeah, I I flew there. Um, and and he met me there. 
and I remember I got off the plane and I was looking for him and he did look quite different to what I thought he looked like um, so he was a little bit older than I had expected him to look um, but I thought that's okay you know he that's okay don't worry about that and I you know the alarm bells kind of went off in my head what am I doing this is quite a crazy thing for me to do especially a person like me that doesn't really take risks um, ever <laughs> yes but I, I didn't and for the first few days it, it was okay um, we, we spoke a lot and I felt like I knew him really well um, we did, I didn't really feel like I, I needed to get to know him that well I felt like I already knew him and, and after a few days he just started saying to me well what's the point in you going back um, we're getting on so well and if you go back then you will you know you're, what are you going back to and really I, I didn't have very much to say back to that because in my head, what what was I going back to? I hadn't really, university wasn't turning out to be what I wanted it to be. And he was saying that things would be much better here. Yeah, so then after a while, I, st- I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to stay. You know, I think, I, I think I'll stay for a bit longer, um, but it, I should go back. Um, I do need to finish off university and I give this a go. Um, and and he said, "Well, you can't." And and at, at the, I was I just remember being like, "Excuse me," um, you know. And he was like, "You can't. I, I you can't go back. I don't want you to leave me. You can't leave me. How are you going to get back? Do you know the area? Do you know the language?" And I I just didn't really know what to say. Um, and we were walking at the time, and we went and had some food and. I just didn't say anything for the whole meal. I didn't know what to say to him. But all I was thinking was, this, is the f- this isn't the, this is what I thought he was like. And it was the first time I really thought, this feels a bit scary now. Um, and by this time, he'd already got my passport. Because when I first met him, he was, oh, give me your passport. I will look after it for you. Um, let me put it in my bag and I didn't think anything of it you know uh, I just thought he was um, being secure being safe and then when the time came I thought I'd go bank and I said you know can I have my passport and he was like no I said to you 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 can't you can't and also I, I, need, I need you to, to help me anyway um, and then that's when he told me what he needed me to be doing Seven years on, thanks to support from Emily and others, alongside her own innate strength and determination, Claire is in a much better place. She is now a social worker, doing her best to ensure people in need of support do not go unnoticed and fall through the cracks. Life is not, nor will it ever be, easy for Claire. But her story fills me with hope. Listeners will know that I like to end every podcast by asking our guests to share what their hope is for the future. And since we're in the season of perpetual hope, I thought I would end this festive wrap up by focusing our minds in the right place. Here's a couple of their responses. There is a lot of happiness um, because I do see a lot of hope. Mm. Um, I get to, as a said I think numerous times throughout this podcast get to work with incredible women get to work with um yeah women who've experienced the very worst and really should yeah you know how how and why they would want to be happy or generous or compassionate towards others um they have no reason to and yet they choose to Mm. um and I love seeing that. I love seeing when um, the women we work with are, yeah, display those traits and are generous and kind, and um, that they, I guess, even grateful for the life that they get to lead. And I think that that's lovely, you know, to be able to 
have gratitude for life and to want to make the most of it despite having had terrible experiences. I've learned a few things. One is you've got to fight for the things that you care about. And sometimes just by occupying a space, by refusing to back down, by shining a light on something, you could make a difference. So you've got to fight hard. You've got to partner with others. So we are working with amazing police teams. We are working with nearly 50 organizations around the world, other charities that we're joining forces with to rescue people. So partnership, there's no chance we tackle a problem of this complexity or scale on our own. Um, and I also think that it, it, this is possible. We can, we can succeed. I don't think it's inevitable that we grow up in a country or hand over a country to our future generations where this is the way it works. We can end it. We can bring trafficking down. And, and I think we need more of that belief and optimism. optimism. So I think they are, they are key lessons for me. And every time I sit with one of our young survivors, and you and I have been out to the you know, Bangladesh, and, and we, we've, we've sat with children who were slaves and are now having a chance to live again. And they've got businesses, or they've got children, and they've got hope again, or they're in a good marriage. When you meet those people, you can see it's doable. So I, I find the cynicism or the skepticism out there that we can ever tackle this problem. I just find it infuriating because you and I have sat with people who prove you can do it. What we need is a scale to that effort. We're not trying to invent a way of succeeding. We know what it takes. We've got to scale it. And that's the task. So I feel immensely optimistic that it can be done in our lifetimes. And even if it isn't, Let's do all we can to get there um, and go skidding into the grave. My hope for us is that we just be a little bit more um, vulnerable and courageous in how we choose to live our lives every day. Um, you know, there's so many times that the world tells us that we need to be a certain way, but um, there's no one size fits all for everybody. And so my hope for everybody is just that whoever you are deep at your core, that you just be that person um, with no shame. And, you know, I think you'll be surprised at what a massive impact you have on the world. So I'm hopeful this experience that we've had of lockdown will permanently change the way that of what we prioritize in life that we've realized just how much we need other people that, you know, living alone isn't what we were designed to do. No one is an island, as John Dunn famously said, we all need each other, right? And if, if you've had that experience, then imagine what it's like to be a vulnerable child with no sense of ongoing security in your life and no one that's out there for you, no one as a backstop. There are kids in our country that are living in caravan parks and on canal barges and are being visited by social workers. And that is not appropriate for anybody, let alone a child that's had a really tough start in life. So my hope is that this terrible, awful thing that is the coronavirus will do something really beautiful and powerful to help us to reboot, reset, reimagine what life needs to look like. And I'm really hopeful and excited about what that could mean for the vulnerable children here in the UK, but the vulnerable children around the world too. And I'm hopeful too. One of the lessons that I have learned this year is the impact of the individual response. Some of these issues seem so huge that you can be forgiven for thinking that they are just too pervasive, too widespread for you to stand any chance of influencing. But you would be wrong. It all starts with an individual, a person who says, not here, not on my watch. I'm going to do something about it, regardless of power, skill or authority. My hope is built on evidence. This podcast has just passed 5,000 downloads. Blue Bear Coffee Co., the producer of this podcast, has seen its sales treble this year. 
we were able to give over twelve and a half thousand pounds to our charities. All of this just came from an idea on a long haul flight. I have cause to be hopeful. What is your hope? What do you wish to influence in 2021? And I will close with the words of Dr. King. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. A big thank you to all of our contributors this year. They were amazing, weren't they? And thank you to you for listening and supporting and encouraging. I'm excited to see what will come in 2021. Until then, peace.